So Sylvia will tell us about acute neuropixels recordings. And uh, Sylvia, you're on and your talk is for about 30 minutes. And okay. I will give you a five minute warning. Great. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, so now this talk will be very practical. Um, kind of a guide of how to do things, how to prepare your probe, do experiments. I just want to say this is one way of doing things. So you may hear from other people to do things differently. This is perfectly fine. Um, so this is just how I did things or we did things and it worked pretty well. The first thing I want to um, show you are these resources. So there's lots of help you can get. Um, first of all, from the NeuroPixels user manual, there's a GitHub page from the Cortex lab about NeuroPixels. There's a wiki page explaining lots of stuff and also an issues page. Um, there's a Slack channel. This is very, very active, constantly used. People are putting very good questions and answers. Um, there's a NeuroPixel site and also a site by Bill Karsh. Um, who developed Spike GLX and has lots of helpful how to do videos. All right, so let's talk about the, the hardware or what you actually get when you, when you order NeuroPixels. So you get uh, one or several of these probes here. You get at least one head stage, uh, an interface cable and an acquisition module. Um, you still need to get one of these chassis and an interface with your computer that actually records the data. Um, in the user manual, you will find recommendations for what kind of chassis to get. Um, I will start now of what to do with the probes when after receiving them. So you will get your probes in a box like this one, um, or you used to. Um, the one thing to remember is the tips of your probes are uh, pointing to the lid of this box. So it's very important um, to open them in the right way, namely like this one. So you lift the, the lid of the box like that. Then the probes are stuck into this foam here. Um, sometimes they're quite difficult to get out. So you may want to loosen them first, for example, with the forceps like so. And then once you've done this, you can hold with one thumb uh, one part of the foam away and then grab the probe with your other hand by its flex cable, okay? So this is a secure way of getting the probe out of the box. Then the first thing you may wanna do is uh, to do some soldering. Um, I think you've talked about how to crown the probe and there are several ways to do this, but we did it by soldering a wire to the reference and the ground. Um, and this is what, what is shown here. So the point is you want to extend um, the ground and the reference electrode with a wire that you can then, so you can ground your probe to the saline or PBS solution that covers the brain. And it is most secure um, to use the soldering patches that are furthest away from the electronics. So all these patches you could be using, but this is the one that's furthest away. And it's just safest because the heat could damage these electronics. And here you can see how this was done. So here um, we use those these topmost patches. All right, so how to do the soldering. There are again, very nice videos, for example, here in this link, just shortly. You first wanna secure your probe, for example, on an elevated tape like here. Um, you take your wire, put it through the first hole on one side, then through the second hole on the other side. Um, then you solder the wire to both patches and actually very little solder is needed. You should use um, lead-based solder because this can operate on, or it melts on at low temperatures. Once you've soldered it, you can connect the wire either just with a crocodile clip, which has longer wire that you can put in the um, saline solution, or you use a connector like this one. Soldering, so doing this properly is very important because it can introduce quite a bit of noise if you don't do it properly. I don't wanna talk about this much, 
therefore I just uh, show you these resources which are very good and show you how to do this properly. And when you've done, you can test um, your soldering, for example, with the voltmeter to see whether the connections are, are good. Once you've soldered, um, then you can prepare or uh, mount the probe to a rod so you can actually hold it and manipulate it. Um, one way to do this relatively easily is to buy NeuroPixels probes that already come with a metal cap like here. So this is shaped in a dovetail and this can then be used to slide it into a rod like this one. So as you can see, hopefully, um, this rod has a dovetail uh, holder and you can slide the probe with its cap into this holder. And um, one of these or these rods um, can be bought from the same company that also sells the manipulators, which I will talk about in a bit. If you don't want to buy it, you can also make it yourself. And there's several resources of technical drawings and also um, uh, 3D models of those caps and also the holders that you could just print or uh, get manufactured by a, for, by a workshop. Um, one thing you should keep in mind is that these um, dovetails come with a price. They are they make the probe heavier. So they weigh now 414 milligrams versus 400 milligrams, and they are they make the probe somewhat bigger. So if this is an important issue for you, you may want to reconsider and, and come up with a different solution or again, look for resources in the community for how to do things differently. All right, so how do you actually mount the probe? So here uh, is shown how you actually put this metal cap or the dovetail onto the probe in case you bought the ones without or you have an older version. So one um, secure way to do this is shown here. And the most important thing to remember is that you need to attach the dovetail so that it is parallel to the probe itself. Otherwise, the probe will not go into the brain straight, right? There will be an angle. Um, so you can, for example, um, attach the, the metal cap onto a surface with a double-sided tape and align this to a marker, for example, the edge of this table. Then you glue with a two component glue, for example, you glue the probe to this cap and you align it to the same marker. So also here to this edge of the table. And once it fi it's fixed in place, you just fix the probe really securely, for example, with a, with a tape so the glue can, can harden. Once the metal cap is, uh, cap is on, you can then mount the probe to the rod. This is shown here. So you just slide the, the probe into the rod using forceps like so, and then fix the probe with the screw that uh, goes through the rod and onto the probe. You can fasten it. Okay, now we have the probe uh, mounted onto the rod. Now we can go to the, or attach the other parts, um, namely the head stage. Um, so the probe has this sieve area, and this um, is the part that needs to be attached to the head stage. So this sieve area has a front side that has the number and uh, this back side. So you need to make sure that you use the right side and the front side and slide it into this head stage like so. So you slide it in here and then secure it um, using this um, lock system. And then it should look like this. Um, so this is quite tricky and a lot of failures can happen here if the, um, the SIF is not really perfectly aligned to the head stage. So if you get an error about this, it just basically try it again and try to align it better to, to the head stage. Um, here is shown one probe on the rod. Here is the head stage. And one way of fixing it to the rod is just using some tape. 
Um, you can also print something. And I think in the community, there are um, several 3D models uh, where you can print something um, to hold the head stage in place onto the rod. Right, so now we have our probe securely on the rod and there's also the head stage. Now we want to put our probe into a manipulator so that you can micro manipulate the probe into the brain. So what we and what I use are manipulators by sensor packs. They look like this. So here's the holder, there's a, a touchpad screen and um, some wheels to move the different axes. So the advantages are that they do not take up that much space. So the, the footprint is quite small. Um, they have four axes of movement. So X, Y, Z, and along the probe, which is of course important if you, when you insert the probe into the brain. Um, the movement range of each axis is 20 millimeters. Um, in addition to this, you can change um, some angles, namely the pitch, um, by some loosening some screws here. So yeah, that's this angle, which you can change mechanically. And also you can change the yaw just by um, loosening this uh, base here and rotating it. Okay. Um, then, of course, the positions can be zeroed at any time and this is recommended and important just before you insert the probe into the brain so you can know at any time uh, how far you inserted the probe already. Um, also each axis of motion can be disabled independently um, which is uh, recommended when you insert the probe or once you have inserted the probe so that you don't accidentally move it around inside the brain. And um, now it also comes with an automated um, movement, so you can automatically insert the probe into the brain at a certain speed, which is helpful. Right, now before you do any recordings, long before, you should really carefully plan how to position your manipulators. So the first thing is to think about and determine in which angles you actually need to insert your probe into the brain so you can record from all the areas you want to record from. Then you need to place your manipulators in the correct angles and you should use some dummy probes or at least the, the rods the, that hold the probes to simulate the positioning so that you can be sure how your, you place the manipulators in space. So for example, how high they should be, how far they should be away from, um, from the brain um, so that your probes end up exactly at the right spot. So this will take some time. Um, if you're using multiple probes, this becomes even a bit tricky, trickier um, because there is the danger of uh, collisions between the probes. However, you do not really need to worry about any collisions inside the brain. It's much more likely that the probes collide outside the brain because um, they're taking, taking space. Um, so you sh should also take some time to, um, to do this with uh, dummy probes. And here, just as an example, I used four probes to insert into one brain area in this mouse. And this is how I place the, the bases of the manipulators um, onto, yeah, onto the, the rig. So even though the probes ended up very closely on one side of the brain, the base plates are quite far away from each other. Okay, a few words about uh, making craniotomies and marking sites. Um, yeah, make sure you, you really mark the sites outside the craniotomy um, so you know where to place your probe because if you just mark it uh, on top of the site then this will be done after you've done your craniotomy um, so for example you can use markers uh, so pens or you, you scratch uh, with a needle onto the bone which cannot be washed away um, you should think about the size of your craniotomy and find a good compromise so if you do a very big craniotomy 
then you have lots of space, but um, the brain can move a lot more, which will give you less stability. If, however, you do a very crin uh, tiny craniotomy, then this will be very difficult to access, um, especially if you may need to remove or cut the dura, or if you have some both uh, bone growth, and there's little flexibility to actually place the probe somewhere else. And yeah, during the surgery, you should also prepare some well, either with dental cement or you print something um, like you print a well that you can then fix to, to the brain, which can then, not to the brain, to the skull, which can then hold the, the saline or the PBMS. Right, and then you, after the recordings, you also wanna know where your probe was in the brain. So you should apply, well, one way to do this is to apply some dye to the probe before each rec recording. And for this, uh, we used to use uh, vibrant dye I, dye or, dye, dye O, or some people also use dye D. If you use brain clearing methods afterwards, you need to have a special dye. And we used vibrant CM dye I, which stays in the tissue even after the clearing. Um, so you just apply the, the dye to the probe. One way is to do it like this. So you just have it in the pipette and um, you, you use a drop hanging from the pipette and then put it on the probe. You don't want to move the drop back and forth, but really just touch it and then go, go off and then do this along the whole length of the probe. Otherwise, um, it's less likely that the dye actually stays on the probe. Um, right, before each uh, recording, um, you do the following. So first, uh, we used to calibrate the manipulators. Um, this may be specific to sensor packs, but probably it's the same for, for lots of uh, manipulators. Um, then you position them at the topmost position. Um, then you place the probes into the manipulators. You could do this before, but uh, for the calibration, the probes or the manipulator actually moves around. So it's more likely that you actually uh, have collisions between the probes. So I always would do it before placing the probes into the manipulators. Um, once you've done this, uh, you can connect or you do connect one interface cable and one ground wire to each probe but you have to make sure that all the ground, ground wires are then connected to a single ground wire, which is placed in the recording well. So if you look very carefully here, the white cables are the interface cables and the blue cable here is one ground wire of this probe. And we have a second blue ground wire for the second probe. And they all end up um, on this one cable and this one wire here, which is then put in uh, on top of the brain. Right, and uh, you should also be careful to fix the cables because if you leave these flexible cables just lying around, it's very likely that they actually swing into your probe and this is a not so nice way of breaking a probe. Right, once you've done this, um, before your recording, you can now position the animal and place the grounding wire. So here you see um, one of our setups. Um, here are the probes. Here is the stage with the animal. And we have this um, yeah, nice way of actually having or moving the, this stage for the animal back and forth on these uh, rails. So you, um, you um, head fix the animal really far away from where the probes are that you placed before, okay? Once the animal, animal is fixed, you can then um, push the whole stage underneath those probes. And this is a top view of the animal and the probes. And here you can already see the ground wire um, just on top of the skull. Here's another way of doing this. All right. Then um, you lower the probes manually. So just um, before we had fixed them, but they were too far away from the brain. So now you really lower them so that the tip of the electrodes is less than two, milli uh, two centimeters away from, from the brain. Okay, and this is just a view of how this should look like. 
after that step. Now, a few words about the insertion. So most likely you, your probe will bend when you try to insert it. This looks pretty scary, but you shouldn't be scared because these probes are extremely flexible. Um, so if you deflect them slowly, that's totally okay. They can take it. You should just not make um, sharp movements. So then they can actually break. The insertions will be easiest shortly after the craniotomy because the dura is usually nice and soft. If you have difficulties inserting the probe, you can try and uh, approach the dura with a higher speed. Um, you can try another location um, if you're flexible in choosing a location. So sometimes just the dura in one place is a bit thicker than in other places. You could try and cut the dura very carefully. You could also try and soak the dura in warm um, ACSF. Um, or another way of keeping the dura from thickening is using, uh, is using dura gel. Um, once you insert the probe in the brain, you should probably use a slow speed. And here's a, a paper that reports that two microns per second works best not to damage the brain too much. Um, one question is how to recognize the brain surface. Um, and one way we found is, is very helpful is to look at the LFP. Once you see large deflections in the LFP, you know that this is the surface of the brain. So at this point, if you see this on your lower probes, you just zero your manipulator. And from there on, you count how deep the probe goes. Um, sorry for the noises, if you hear any. <laughs> um, yeah, of course, once, once you insert the probe, you should not uh, move the probe in any other axis other than along the probe. So you really need to be careful not to move the manipulator in the other axis. And the best way to do this is just to inactivate other axes. Then also, if you in, uh, insert the probe, always keep a look, an eye on the probe, because sometimes it happens that the first, you know, microns, it looks all fine. You've inserted the probe through the dura, and then you think everything looks fine, you turn away, but it can happen that the, the probe gets stuck somehow at the dura or who knows, and then it bends. So you need to uh, make sure that this doesn't happen or you stop the probe from further uh, from further insertion. Um, yes, and once your recording depth is reached, uh, it's we found it, it's a good idea to retract the probe again by about 100 microns, so you release some tension, and which will increase your recording stability. And we also used to wait about 10 minutes before starting the recording, so the probe can actually settle in and there will be no slow movements of the brain. Uh, relative to the probe. And we used to only then fill the recording chamber with saline or ACSF. Right, and then at the end or after your recordings, uh, you need to take care of your probes um, so you can reuse them. So we cleaned them with um, tergosine. So you soak them in tergosine for about 30 minutes and then soak them or rinse them with the ionized water. And we used to just keep them in, in the water until we do the next recording. Probably other enzymatic cleaners also will work. Um, I haven't tried any other, um, but you can also clean your probes with alcohol. And that's, that's it. That's my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Great, Sylvia. I was about to give you the five minute sign, but you're perfect in timing. Um, so there are quite a few questions in the Q and A, um, and I'm going to ask people to remember to upvote questions if they have the same questions. So I'll start asking you some of the things in there because not everybody is looking at the questions. So um, from uh, Ida. Uh, what happens if one does not cut the sides of the flex cable, if one uses the pads to solder on ref ground wires? I'm not sure I understand this question. So if you just don't cut, I don't think 
anything happens. Yeah, the cutting is just optional. Uh, if it's convenient to cut them uh, so that you can, you know, tuck it away somewhere, then you're welcome to do it, but you don't have to cut it. Cool. Um, from uh, Joe Wexelblatt, but, um, have you experienced small angle variations of the probe themselves? And if so, how do you deal with this? We see near Pixels 1.0 probes often come with a non-zero angle. I guess the shank is a little angled relative to the, to the base. Ah, I see. I haven't experienced this, or I guess I haven't measured it. I actually use, if it's about the metal cap, we actually used to um, glue it ourselves. Um, I guess, yeah, I, I don't have any, I don't know if anyone looked at this, how um, serious this if is, if it's, a, it's a, if it's not 100% straight, but like a tiny angle, you go down the brain. I mean, there will be, you will cut more than is absolutely necessary. Um, this so might I don't be know when it's really. Class. This might be more of an issue with the caps. Wait, I think I think there's so I think if you if you are attaching your own cap, you definitely need to make sure that the cap axis is aligned with the probe axis. That's for sure. If yeah. you if you get the cap, uh, or the probes with the cap already on it, that axis should be. Um, I, I would be surprised if you could measure any um, misalignment between the cap and the probe shank. But my guess is that what Joe's referring to is probably the um, other axis, so the, the probe tilting up and down, which um, there are tight quality control specs on iMac. And I think that there's a, there's a spec on that. It's like you're supposed to only be able to have, I think, one, one or 200 microns deflection of the tip relative to the base. Uh, but there can be a very slightly non-zero um, deflection. I think if you, if you see like just one probe that you think is really bad, I would even see if you can get him. Okay. Shouldn't be, um, but if you if you have like in general, your probes are um, just a little bit off, I think there's probably not much you can do about it. We, we think in general that the sources of error in your targeting are probably um, more dominated by other factors than that. That's probably what I'd say about okay. that. Okay, um, Sylvia, I think you have time to respond to, to answer to one or, more, or, or two. I'll tell you which ones, but then if you could stick around and answer the remaining ones by typing, that would be amazing. And some of them are covered by other lectures, uh, so you may want to tell them, wait for this. So, for example, you said something about the Dura, but before inserting the probes, is it necessary to remove the Dura? Um, you said you, you would cut it with great care. Would, do you want to explain what the advantages and disadvantages are? So ideally, I wouldn't um, do anything to the Dura, but just penetrate it with a probe itself. I think Nick may talk about sharpening the probes later on. So this increases the probability that you can actually penetrate the Dura. Um, yeah, cutting the Dura, you have to be very careful um, because of the animal and also for bleeding. So I would do this only if really necessary, if you can't do anything other than that. I haven't tried really any of the other methods. So. Okay. so some people who are listening might work with rats. In that case, it might be a necessity to cut through. Right, yes. I didn't say I only work with mice. <laughs> yes, exactly. OK. Um, and but yeah, that... usually during the surgery, we do not remove the Dora. Okay. I think it's better for the There's brain question... like, not to remove the Dora. There's a question about ground wire versus ground screw that I think Nick is going to get to, but you could tell us um, how many times on average can we reinsert the probe before losing channels and contact sites? This is a tough one. <laughs> well, if you're careful and you're cleaning the probe well, if we used to reuse it like months, I think more than a year probably. Usually what I know, well, usually what happened is that we broke the probe eventually. Um, but I don't have any statistics. It's really yeah hard to yeah, see what happens. Good. I hear from people that sometimes it really deteriorates. And I guess it's unclear why this happens. I would be careful. Some people use like bleach or something. <laughs> so I would be careful with really um, harsh chemicals um, uh, trying to clean the probe. Yeah. 
Okay, some of these questions also you'll find answers in the NeuroPixel Slack, not this course Slack, but there's a NeuroPixel Slack. For example, our lab manager Charo suggests using Tergazyme and other things uh, while sonicating, um, but this comes with caveats, which you might damage the, pro the program.